Hello folks and welcome back to the channel. Together with these great partners, we are able to bring you quality information to help you reach your whitetail habitat goals quicker but more proficiently. Northwoods Whitetails Plot Doctor Harper Growing Solutions Scent Thief Real Wood Productions Ace Hardware of Harrodsburg, Kentucky. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. Hard to believe, uh, September 15th, middle of the month here. Things are going good here in Kentucky. We've had two evening sits uh, that I put in. One was kind of interrupted by coyotes, and the other we actually seen uh, a really good buck. He's just not on our uh, hit list this year. Uh, had a two -year, uh, really good two-year-old come in water out of the tank, but not the bucks that we were looking at. So today what we're going to do is we're going to touch on a couple of things here. Over the years, uh, like school of hard knocks, right? We all learn as we as we age and, and mature as, as hunters in general, but bow hunters especially. And there's a couple of things, there's multiple things that we could put on this list, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to do five uh, mistakes that hunters make while on stand. Uh, so many mistakes that we make throughout the entire year. Uh, you know, don't get our chore list done, things that we're not um, doing correctly, getting to the stand, getting out of the stand, but we're going to touch on five mistakes that uh, we make while on stand. So number one is something that I've been working on the last couple of years. It's a, uh, it doesn't seem huge importance to a lot of people, but it's become probably uh, the most important thing that I've tried to do as a bow hunter the last several years. And that is, uh, I've got it listed here as bull, uh, bull pull-up ropes and metal noise. So just like everyone uh, tuning into this, I'm sure we've all, we've all do that, is when we get to a, a stand, I always prep my stand with a bull, bull pull-up rope. Um, I've actually started using the, the um, ones from HME that are actually um, reflective. So that really helps if you're coming in on, you know, with a flashlight in the morning, they reflect. But the problem with it is, is how many times have you crawled in a stand, hooked that bow on, uh, when you're, you climb up, you get settled in, go to reach down, pull up that bow, and your bow tings and bangs on that ladder. Like I said to a lot of folks, maybe it isn't a huge deal, but one thing that I do not like to do at all is make any noise. First of all, but metal on metal noise, you might as well uh, might as well ring the the alarm and tell everybody in the woods that you're there, especially those those cold um, pre rut or rut mornings, right? Colder it is, louder that sound carries, and it's it can get you into big trouble. So that's the first thing that I have tried to fix, and how I fixed that this year is going with this um, this Insights pack. And it is, it is large, but I'm able to start packing my bowl on my back. So it's a padded, quilted interior. Um, the stabilizer, uh, I do have to take stabilizer off to, um, to keep my counterweight on, but or keep my stabilizer on, take my counterweight off, and, you know, have to re-put that on and off every time I get in and out of the stand. Uh, kind of a downfall of it, but packing the bowl on my back has totally changed uh, things over the last several years. Now last year I was actually tying my uh, bow on my pack. This year I'm able to put it in there and really looking forward to that because when I get to the stand I climb, I immediately climb up the stand. There's no farting around, there's no going to the, uh, which is a separate video, but no, no going out to the licking branch and nothing. I come right in the back door, climb right up the stand and my bow is there. Take my pack off, put it on the, the hang it on the tree. The bow goes on the hook, no noise. So two, and I'm I'm probably more guilty of this one than a lot of folks are because of the back my background. Number two is uh, talking or do, do, doing an interview while on stand. So a couple of things there we'll touch on. If you're doing some filming or self filming or uh, filming for a uh, you know TV. Uh, station or channel or whatever that case is, a show, I guess. Those interviews are great. The problem with it is, is I highly recommend making sure that you've got a wireless mic so you don't have to talk as loud, but 
I have started doing when I am filming, not doing the interview in the stand. Now, if you're successful and you shoot something, yes, after the fact, right after the shot. But before, time and time and time again, I think folks go in and they, it's just one of those pieces of puzzles that I have taken out of what I'm doing. And I really encourage you to do that you know, yourself. Take that out of that equation. The reason that is, is, is it's just, it's, you can stay just that much more quiet. Two guys in the tree, two guys talking, movement, you have all the, everything working against you from the, from the start. And I've seen that time and time and time again, get folks in trouble. The reason that you're in that stand location is because uh, you're probably in the pre-rut or the rut closer to bedding. The early season, maybe late season, you can get away with that when you're hunting more towards the food sources. But I've got a note on here. When I see folks doing an interview, I can usually tell you that they're sitting on a food plot because they think that the deer, they're there and the deer aren't bedded close, which ties into the whole stand placement. If you're on the edge of food, you're able to talk, deer aren't close to you. You're probably not going to be, you're, you're going to be sitting there all day for the last 10 minutes of daylight. There's a better stand placement to begin with. So I, I really think that's something that I've taken out of, of, of my, um, you know, daily regimen when I'm in a stand and I highly recommend you do so as well. Giving the deer the wind. This, this is one that ties into design and, and the way that your farm is set up and stuff like that, right? But giving the deer the wind in general is a poor strategy. I've never been able to wrap my, my head around the fact why. Uh, there's a couple of, I won't name any names, but there is a couple of uh, scent elimination or scent control products out there and or um, garments that slogans are are or very close to just give them the hunt. Don't worry about the wind, just go in and hunt. Well, that to me is a horrible strategy. That tells me that your stand placement is wrong, whether that is in the early season, pre-rut, rut, or late season. That strategy should never be working for you. There's there's never a reason when you should give the deer the wind. If you're giving the deer the wind, you're on the wrong side of bedding. Uh, you're in front of the line of travel, directly in line with that travel going to and from feed. You're not teeing into the line of travel like we teach, right? So uh, that's one thing, guys, that I, I highly recommend. Even if you're in a box blind, don't think that you can lock the windows and get away with it. Remember. You can sit there all night in a box blind, and yes, you can contain your scent. Uh, Ozonics in there with you, spray down wherever the case is. When you open those windows, that scent is going out, especially like I do in a box blind. I don't sit with the windows closed in the front. I never open with the windows behind me for visibility, just to keep it darker behind you, right? But the, the windows in front, when that wind is coming in the window, and you don't have a way for it to escape, such as the stand locations that we talk of, always making sure that that wind is... Uh, that uh, cedars and and uh, you know brush behind you, let's say, is uh, can is perforated, so that wind can perforate through there, right? Can get gone. In a box blind situation, it comes in the front window. It's going back out the front window, and I think that gets a lot of folks in trouble. Um, just thinking that you give the deer the wind, it doesn't matter which wind it is. You can just go in and hunt them. Huge, huge mistake. Number four, um, self filming. This is this one's going to ruffle some feathers, and I understand that. Um, it's not so much the self filming, right? It's the it's the it's how that you're moving, the movement I've got listed here, movement and after the shot. It's the movement that it takes to as a hunter to take focus off from what you're doing and put it on the camera and not on the hunt. Time and time and time again in this world we live in is everybody wants to film their hunt. Everybody wants to be the, the, the next great um, videographer, right? And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of folks out there in the, in the country that are great videographers. I w was on both sides of the camera. But when I was on the camera side, I made it a point not to screw up that hunter's hunt. In today's age, we're actually screwing up our own hunts by doing that. And the reason for that is, guys, is you're moving so much trying to get that camera, get that deer in frame, 
and you go to draw back, the deer walks out of the camera. Next thing you know, you bump the, you got to bump the camera. You got to take your focus off. And what you're doing is you're not focusing on the shot. And you're moving way too much is what I see a lot of. Then the after the shot is, as soon as the shot goes off, as soon as you release that arrow, everybody's grabbing the camera and trying to get the deer in frame to film me. Well, you're not paying attention on how the deer reacted to the shot, where they went, landmarks that they'd run past, um, everything that ties into it. The deer I shot last year here in Kentucky is a perfect example. When he left, I swore up and down when I shot that deer, I missed him. And he ran up the, the uh, transition right before he went out into one of the shot plots, into one of the hood plots, he stopped, his tail was up the entire way, and he stopped, looked both ways, ran out, and he just bounded off. And that, I could not have got the camera on him quick enough and where he went, I couldn't have seen him in the camera anyway. That intel made, could have make, made or, or broke that situation. And what happened was, is he was so relaxed coming out of bedding on his way to food. He had no idea he was, he was stretching and yawning at the water tank and he had no idea it was anywhere in there. He was just so relaxed. And with the mega meats there from G5, sharp broadheads went through him. He didn't even know what happened, right? So that doesn't happen all the time. Usually when, you know, deer runs off, ears up, tails up, that's not a good sign. But focus on the deer before, focus on the deer after, um, if you are going to be the videographer separate from the hunter make sure that you go everything that you can possibly do your scent control you know like eliminating your motions everything that you can do because the worst thing in the world uh, is to have a hunt get blown because the cameraman got busted in the tree number five um aiming for the point of impact guys i i think the a lot of folks in, with archery tackle don't don't aim for the heart. They want to aim for where they want the arrow to end up. Well, if you shoot a target, you shoot spots, you shoot a 3D target all, all summer long, you're aiming where you want to hit. So when folks get to the woods, they are aiming where they want the arrow to hit. Well, that's not, that's, that's a horrible strategy uh, that you learn as you go. And sadly, how you learn that is some lost deer. Years and years ago, I started doing it myself, and I've and I've preached this to my clients. I preach this to my um, to my hunters when I was guiding full time. Most cases, you want to aim low. Now, I'm not saying aim under the deer. I want to aim at the heart because if they don't duck the arrow, you're going to shoot them in the heart. If they do duck it, which 99.9% .9 of deer do they react to the shot and they were going to settle into it and you were going to hit them in the lungs where you want the arrow to be, but it's not where your aiming point should be to begin with. If you aim at the lungs, they drop, you're going to hit them in the nose zone. It happens time and time again as a guide. Sadly, uh, multiple, multiple, multiple deer a year get hit in the nose zone. And the reason for that is, is these deer drop six, eight, 10, 12 inches. One of the ways to help that is make sure when you take that shot before you break that shot, uh, now with a gun, totally different story. Put it on where you want to shoot, right, and and uh, and break the shot. But with a bow, before you break that shot, you have to make sure that that deer's head is up. If the deer's head is down, what you're doing is they're actually preloaded, and they are their head is down, and all the momentum, all their weight from their head and their shoulders and everything can be pulling that down even more. And what happens is it just preloads. The escape. Uh, number six is the bonus. Um, the lights, uh, the headlamps, and the loud entrances and exits. That's, uh, you know, so, so part of that is getting to the stand, right? But the lights and the headlamps in the stand, getting ready, uh, and this goes back to the days when I was filming, and, you know, sometimes you just got to sit and watch it. Uh, but I'm the guy that has uh, you know, green or red on my headlamp, and I, I got away from wearing, I don't wear a headlamp at all anymore. I've got a handheld, um, hand, another reason where the backpack comes in, right? My hands are free, so I've got a little flashlight. It's, it's all, I take a green uh, permanent marker and I marker the whole top of the lens. And I actually, when I'm walking in, uh, only about a, a third of that flashlight is on. I've got my finger over the end of it. So not only is it a low lumen light to begin with, I'm shutting it down even more. 
The reason I don't put that headlamp on is because wherever you are looking, that thing is, is going through the, the timber, right? So there's five steps there, guys, that most hunters make the mistakes um, that I think once you age as a bow hunter, I just started eliminating all that stuff, and it has really, really helped me um, over the last several years, and, and I hope these tips help you. Thanks, guys.